Welcome to the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. I'm your host, Jacob Cooper, best-selling author of Life After Breath and the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. For those of you who are brand new to my channel, we welcome you. Please make sure to continue to be a part of our community by hitting that subscribe button as well as bell notification icon to stay up to date for weekly podcast interview right here on the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. But today's guest is Stephanie Arnold. Stephanie is a best-selling author of the book, 37 Seconds. She's a fellow near-death experiencer, and she has a profound uh, story to tell. So without further ado, we welcome Stephanie Arnold on the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. Stephanie Arnold, thank you so much for coming here on the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. I absolutely loved reading your book, 37 seconds and I've recommended to so many of my friends that I know we've connected um, as both near-death experiencers and I've been a big fan of your work and follower of your work but uh, you know your story really penetrated my heart as it really touched on faith family um, you you even brought up a lot of your own benefit from therapy and hypnosis things that I do but for viewers who are not you know exactly certain what happened to you? Uh, could you maybe discuss um, what brought you to this whole uh, near death experience? Because it's ironic that my name is Jacob and you're here on my ladder because it seemed like there was another Jacob that was very pivotal on your own journey. Uh, so tell us a little bit about you know the what what happened because to me it was just a profound miracle that you're here in front of me today. Amazing introduction, really great segue, really amazing connection to your story and podcast to mine. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I uh, I was pregnant with our last child and it was a boy and his name was Jacob. <laughs> and, uh, at the 20 week ultrasound, I was diagnosed. I had no issues with my first pregnancy. Um, she was, I delivered her no problem, but the only issue was that she was so big that I had to have a C-section. So that was the only complication I had. When Jacob, um, was at the 20 week old, you know, 20 weeks, I had, I was diagnosed with the placenta previa, which is basically the placenta is growing on top of the cervix. But they tell women it's, you know, it's a one in 200 risk. It is very common. They tell you not to lift really heavy things. But as the belly grows and as the uterus grows, it should move out of the way. Um, but in that moment, I had this impending doom. It was, I told my husband at that moment, I said, I've got a bad feeling. And he's like, honey, you've got great prenatal care, great doctors, you know, they're telling you it's not really a big deal. So let's not stress about it. But as soon as I went home, I started Googling everything I could about a placenta previa. And turns out that a placenta previa can turn into a placenta accreta, which is what Kim Kardashian had, which is when the placenta marries itself to the uterus. Um, if that happens, there could be some complications where one could bleed. If that happens, uh, you might not only have to deliver the baby early, but uh, you might need a hysterectomy. If that happens, you could hemorrhage, bleed out. And the worst case scenario is you and the baby can die. And in that moment, I looked at my husband and I said, this is going to happen to us. Wow. The only difference is, is um, the baby's going to be fine, but I'll be dead on the operating table. Mm. Mm. And it was such, um, I, I call it a knowing. One, you don't know how you know, you just do. And um, I, I just knew it was going to happen. And of course, my husband, who, for your audience, they don't know him or haven't read the book, he is a PhD economist. He's a professor at the University of Chicago. He was a former Air Force pilot. He's a brainiac. He is very grounded. Math isn't statistics or his language. So talking to him about a feeling that I have in the future that might happen <laughs> that's statistically improbable um, did not compute. And so... Of course, he's like, honey, what you're worried about happening is not going to happen. Um, 
but you know, we speak different languages. I have learned over the years that the way he handled certain things, um, and he got a lot of flack on the Netflix show that we did surviving death because they were like, Oh, you, you, you don't deserve your wife. And you know, you should, and to me, like you should divorce him. And I'm like, I'm like, no, no, no. I was angry and you could see it on the, um, on the episode. But after that, I realized, you know what, he speaks a different language than I do. He did the best he could with the tools in his toolbox. And I can't be mad at him for that. I was scared. And, um, and, I was using what I knew in my toolbox to save, save my life. So I, so what does one do? Well, you can either shut up or you can speak up. And I told everyone what was going to happen. I went to every doctor's appointment, every nurse, every clinician I met with. And I said, my placenta previa is going to turn into a creta. I'm going to hemorrhage. You guys are going to need a lot of blood. I'm O negative, which is rare blood type. Um, I'm going to need a hysterectomy. Uh, it, I went on and on and on. And when I lecture at hospitals or when I when I talk to to um, medical institutions, they're like, "This woman's crazy, right?" And, you know, every everybody everybody thought I was crazy. And you know, in their defense, I will say that everything that I was afraid of happening tested negative, you know, all along my pregnancy from five months on, I was like, this is going to happen. At one point I went to, um, I got, I learned that if I needed an emergency hysterectomy when I give birth, that I would want a gynecological oncologist to do it because my OB won't be able to do it. They'll transfer me to maternal fetal medicine, but a gynoc has more experience with um, high risk reproductive organ surgeries and having a hysterectomy when 20% of your blood supply is going to your uterus probably might be too much information for you, Jacob. So just let me know. <laughs> That's no, <laughs> no. I, what, what, what I love about people like yourself and Anita Morjani, uh, for instance, is there's a medical miracle to your story, mm -hmm. which I think speaks to so many people who are uncertain about their own health that, um, you know, for many reasons, but your continuity, I think, speaks to a lot. But I loved about your book was every little word to me uh, spoke to me, but the integrity that you brought with the honesty that you had, it wasn't everything was evidential, was valid, was true. And I think people gravitate to truth. And that's why your book and your story has transformed so many people, but the medical component I know is a big part of your work because so many people really need to hear that in a way we're more than our bodies. There's this thing beyond uh, life. And I'm sure that has struck a lot of people that you've encountered. Yeah. I, but also speaking up when you sense something is wrong, I think, I think when you are confronted with a lot of people with big letters behind their names you think, okay, well, they know better than I do. And it, the, the fear factor that one gets into when they go to a hospital or that they're, they're pregnant, or the reality is, it's like, you might actually know your body better. And in many cases you do than the physicians handling it. And, and so I'm constantly reminding people that I'm like, if you sense it, say it, what's the worst that could happen? You could be wrong. Okay. So they judge you. They think you're crazy. Everybody's like, you know, everybody does it on your Instagram profile. So the fact that you are going to say something and act, and they're not going to believe you, um, what happens just like in my case, one person does, it can actually save your life. Oh, yeah. So, you know, that's the, it's, it, it is a, a valuable lesson for, for those out there that feel something that think that they're crazy or want to shy away from these feelings because they think that they're not valid. And I'm here to tell you that they are. Yeah. What I got from your book was that you and your spouse are a definite power couple. And I think for you to come out publicly with intuition, you know, with the background that you're in and the spouse that you had, I know will speak to a lot of people that there's a great value in owning your truth, regardless of maybe if the people closest to you get it or not. Um, but but for you, was this like a one-off that you had with your son, Jacob, or you've had other intuitive experiences 
beyond this and since this experience have you been able to familiarize yourself with that intuition um would you say yeah it's it's not a one-off um i think when i was a kid i you know, I know as a kid, I had a couple of moments that it, my feelings have always been about life and death. So I would feel it. I'd be like, think about that person. And the next minute, that was the moment that they passed. And it scared me as a kid because I thought I was manifesting it. I thought I was willing it to happen. So I mm -hmm. shut it down until it was my own foreboding. Um, when I got to, I'll, I'll just finish and get to the near deaths for your, for your audience, but, you know, meeting with all these doctors at some point I had, I met with the guy Nank. He was like, how can I help you? And I was like, you're going to give me a hysterectomy when I give birth. And he was like, are you diagnosed with anything? Why are you here? Mm -hmm. I'm like, um, and I explained, this is going to happen. And I explained it over and over again. He's like, have you been on the internet? And I'm like, well, yes, I have doctor, but this is going to happen. Right. So that's his resident stops writing. He's like, all right, Mrs. Arnold, let, let's get you an MRI. If the MRI is positive for an accreta, that merger between the placenta and the uterus, we'll, we will schedule your hysterectomy the day that you give birth. Mm -hmm. And I felt better because I was like, okay, this is something a little bit more invasive than what I've been doing with my ultrasounds. It's not going to hurt the baby, but at least maybe, maybe this doctor has seen something and uh, has had a patient because he deals with cancer patients all the time of this kind of sense. Um, what is this impending doom? And maybe there's something else indicating it. And the MRI is negative for what I feared. And so Jonathan was like, okay, are we done? Like, we're good. Let's just move forward. And I'm like, no, now I'm running out of people to tell this crazy foreboding story too. So of course, what does one do with social? I post on Facebook. If anybody has my blood type, I need it. Um, I wrote goodbye letters. I said goodbye letters. I sent them out. And then I had um, my OB who you see on the show is uh, she said, are you still having the visions? And I said, yes. And she said, why don't you have a consultation with anesthesia? And you know, it's everybody's right to have their consultation with anesthesia. So I call anesthesia on the phone. This Dr. Grace um, she answers and she said, you know, she explained that um, where I would recover, epidural, all these things. And I, again, this was my last attempt to tell somebody else what was going on. And she said, look, Mrs. Norman, we're in a teaching hospital. We prepare for emergencies. Um, I hope I helped you. I hope ease your pain. And at that moment, I didn't know what I found out later. Um, but she said the last words I said to her were very haunting, which was, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Because it was, that was it. So the day I went in to give birth, Jonathan's on a plane from New York. Um, I'm in Chicago giving birth at Northwestern Memorial, which delivers 12,000 babies a year, teaching hospital, very big hospital. And um, they, you know, my daughter, Adina is there, who's a little under two at the time. And, wow. you know, I hug her a million times because I'm convinced it's the last time I'm going to see her. Huh. Um, I send Skype chat messages to Jonathan while he's on the plane. And I, again, tell him he's made me the happiest woman in the world. Please take care of your children. This is not his fault. Um, and he's still not getting it. So he's like, where do I meet you? And I said, eighth floor recovery, hopefully. <laughs> and then they wheel me down to the OR. And again, I'm telling my doctor, there's something wrong. You need to put me under general anesthesia. And she said, Stephanie, I'm not going to do that because if I do that, then I put the baby to sleep. I know you're nervous, but, um, but let's go ahead and, and get him out and you've been stressed. So they wheel me into the room that's going to give life to my son and take mine. Hmm. And I'm convinced of it. So the fear is palpable. They set you up for a C-section, which is you know, there's a curtain in front of your face. My arms are in a T, you know, it's cold. Um, they tell me later that it was like 15 minutes before I delivered Jacob, but I was catatonic. They were talking to me. They were trying to help me. Um, get comfortable, but I wouldn't answer. And I think in that moment, I think you get so scared to to death that you separate, you compartmentalize in some respect, you hide, whatever. 
Um, so they delivered Jacob happy and healthy. Mm -hmm. And the next minute I'm dead. I ended up having a, an amniotic fluid embolism, which is a very rare pregnancy complication, which amniotic cells get into the mother's bloodstream. And if you happen to be allergic to it, your body goes into anaphylactic shock. And in most cases, you don't make it. Um, it was, I flatlined for 37 seconds. And then they were able to get me back up uh, through CPR and shocking my body. And then they intubated me and they taped my eyes shut. And then the second phase of an AFE, an amniotic fluid embolism, is your body's inability to clot blood, which is oh. the acronym, well, the letters are DIC, which is disseminated inter something coagulation. Um, and, uh, and the anesthesiologists have nicknamed this acronym, um, death is coming. Hmm. So your body has about 20 units of blood and my body needed about 60 units of blood and blood product to save my life. Wow. And then, you know, Jacob was born happy, healthy, taken to the maternity ward in the nursery. And um, that's when Jonathan arrived. And so they stabilized me. They put me into the surgical ICU. I was in a medically <laughs> coma. And then... Um, when Jonathan got there, he told the anesthesiologist when they had a consultation about what happened, he said, if she needs a hysterectomy, this is the doctor we met with two months ago. And she said, you know, she thought that was odd, but they took down the notes and they didn't think that, um, one, I couldn't survive another surgery at that moment. I'd lost so much mm -hmm. blood and, and mm -hmm. I needed a chance to recover. But also they didn't think that I would need one. They thought that they stopped the hemorrhage. Um, about seven hours later, uh, Jonathan's in the ICU with me and the bells are still going off that I am still hemorrhaging. So they wheel me back into the OR and they do the, perform the hysterectomy. And when they do the pathology on the uterus, they show mm -hmm. that an accreta had started to form, but maybe at the time I took the MRI or where it was located, mm -hmm. um, it was undetectable. So everything I thought was going to happen actually happened. And Jonathan wow. likes to Jonathan likes to joke about it, says, "Yeah, but I don't I get a star like <laughs> said that you were going to survive." You know, <laughs> I was like I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> It's like uh, guys doing the dishes and wanting like a, a bonus for it yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's like a guy thing. We always <laughs> want the cred, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um so I was in a medically induced coma for six days. Um, you know, we're Jewish and Jacob was going to have a bris, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the circumcision on day eight. And Jonathan said, you know, it was just an interesting dynamic over those days. My kidneys had failed. They started dialysis. Um, mm -hmm. I had a heart attack. I, you know, they were still, you know, trying to see if there was, um, if, at how much neurological deficit I was in and they wouldn't know until they extubate you to see like where you are, or how they know, you know, if the brain is functioning and, you know, Jonathan said, um, he would go out of the room, get something to eat, he'd come back there, be like mm. challah and wine. And like some Chabadnik had come dropped it off, like, you know, little minion and walking out. No one ever saw anybody. And, mm. and then nurses and all different denominations from all different religions were praying, at the time I was the highest acuity case in the maternity ward. So I was in a separate hospital and it was a long 15 minute walk between hospitals um, to get to the nursery. So Jonathan would have time to think process, walk to see the baby and then come mm. back and process and then come back to see me. Mm. And, um, and so he said to the rabbi, he's like, you know, what do we do about the circumcision? And he's like, well, as long as the baby's fine, you do the circumcision. He's like, but I want my wife to be there. And he's like, you know, I don't know what to do. And he's like, then you pray. And he's like, but I don't have it in me to pray. And he's like, you pray. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I don't know what he did. I think he went to the little chapel. I think he, you know, talked to a bunch of people or he talked to himself. He really like, kept to himself. Mm -hmm. And um, on day six or day seven, they extubated me and I am 
edemic. So I'm really swollen. I am, again, my kidneys had failed. So I was retaining a lot of fluid. And uh, the very first thing <coughs> said was, am I still fucking pregnant? <laughs> and Jonathan was like, in that moment, he's like, I think she's going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> you have your, you have your spunk still. Yeah. Yeah. She's like one, she knew where she was and two, she was cursing. So <laughs> it was, we might get a little bit of her back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and then the process of recovery started. I, I was in the hospital for a month, but um, the physical was healing it healed like over a six month mm. period and and my brain um i had little i definitely had deficit i still do but but it's more of um like i couldn't read i couldn't read children's wow. books i couldn't have and it was frustrating so i couldn't bond with my children and i wanted nothing to do with anybody and you know jonathan was really trying he was the mother the father the caregiver the husband he was everything and mm. And I was angry. Um, I think that during that, the hospital stay. So when you are in a, a hospital like this, you have, they do rounds and I mean, they do rounds in all hospitals, but they do resident teaching rounds where you're, you're being educated through, you know, different departments. And because I had so many different departments on me and me around me, I had everybody asking me like students alike that were just like, you had, you know, and I said, I don't know. Why don't you tell me, you know? And so they said, well, foreboding happens prior to an embolus or a heart attack, mm -hmm. but moments before, maybe a couple of days before, but three months before in the detail that you had it, mm -hmm. you know, I don't have an answer for that. You know, one doctor told me he was very, very, he was on the board at the hospital said, you know, I think you need to go spiritual on this one. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was very scared to do that because even though I'm a person who believes in God and I have faith, um, there was something really daunting about this process because if one feels, which I did at that time, that I could manifest because one asshole doctor, and I don't know whether I can curse him. <laughs> so I <apologize. laughs> Um, I, I, I'm from New York here. It's okay, here. great, great. <laughs> so one doctor said, you know, when I went to thank everybody, you know, everybody was like, you know, I'm so happy to see you. And, you know, that's great. And one nurse came over and she was just like, you know, you probably don't remember me. I said, and instantly it was like a download. I'm like, you were the one that did CPR. You broke my ribs. Hmm. And she said, and I do it again to save your life. And I heard later she went back to her office and cried because I shouldn't know that. Wow. Right? You know, I flatlined. Like, why would I know that? And then, and then, uh, so this one doctor said, uh, self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm. I said, oh, okay. You believe that I can manifest blood hemorrhage. I can manifest um, my organs combining and I can mm. manifest all that. He's like, well, not really, but I just, you know, there's nothing else I can come up with. And I said, well, it's a ridiculous thing to say because I'm already feeling guilt that I manifested this and could have taken myself away from my children. So, um, so that was really difficult to, to process. I had, um, I, I think, you know, when I went to therapy, traditional therapy, they were like, you know, we can help you get you, you know, to a more stable mental place. And I said, well, first to, co you, to cope. Yeah, basically. Oh, and I said, well, first tell me how it is. I saw everything. And they're like, well, let's not worry about that right now. Let's just worry about getting you out of the PTSD. Mm -hmm. And I said, see, I have a problem with that because what happens if I think I'm going to have a heart attack? Am I going to have a heart attack? What if I think mm -hmm. my child's going to get into a problem? Is that, is that going to happen? Mm -hmm. And so they didn't have answers for me. And, you know, my story came out, um, you know, pretty early on, like six months after it happened. And we were on a talk show and the host, we we're talking about intuition and it was a, a Mother's Day story. And was it this was, Steve, was this Steve Harvey or this what? Steve, it was. Yeah. So Steve Harvey says, you know, did you see the light? And I said, I don't know, man, they gave me a lot of drugs, you know? And so, <laughs> you know, to be honest, I, I didn't remember. And um, 
but I thought it was, um, I didn't think it was the right, whether right or wrong answer. I didn't think if I didn't know, um, how could I answer that correctly? So I didn't know if there was a way to find out, but I was going to find out because what I needed to know was nobody can answer what happened in the 37 seconds, nor could anybody answer like what I had seen in the subsequent days when I was in a coma that I had thought I'd seen. And then I wanted some information, like maybe if I slow things down, maybe those three months that I was feeling these things, maybe there was something else going on around that, um, that could give me answers. So a friend of mine recommended me to go to, um, regression therapy and regression therapy. If, if your audience knows many lives, many masters by Dr. Brian Weiss, he wrote a book about past life regression. This woman studied with him and worked with him for about eight years and, she, you know, it's basically using hypnosis mm -hmm. to take you into these moments that you might remember. I was not interested in past life regression. I didn't think that it, unless I could speak a completely different language, there was no way to prove whatever it is that we were going to find out. But I was interested in, could I get back to these moments that I'm, mm -hmm. that I questioned before. And, uh, you know, what she said is like, we won't know until we get in there. It's basically using hypnosis to take you into moments of trauma. And they use this for all different levels of mm -hmm. trauma, but it's basically to say that, okay, this already happened to a part of you. It is not going to be as painful, but we are going, you're safe here, but we're going to remember those moments and see if, under a calm set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Do you remember it? And she talks about it being like film strips, in, stored in your brain and you're going to access them mm. and be able to recover some of those memories. I was not optimistic. Um, Jonathan was telling me, I don't think this is a good idea. Uh, I think that under his, you know, limited research, he was like, what if you remember things that, that happen and then they re-traumatize you or you get worse or you unlock something that maybe you didn't want to know or whatever. But for me, and maybe it's, you know, maybe it's the type A personality and just for your audience know, I mean, my career as a, as a TV producer and telling other people's stories, mm -hmm. I'm very research oriented. So, so having, you know, this to do and say, okay, I have a big question. This was like an episode of house and I'm like, right. I need to, I need an answer. <laughs> right? You were like, you were like your own subject in your work. Like I your am. work was becoming alive to first person. Yeah. It was, and Jonathan just kept saying, why are you doing this? And I said, mate, call it a woman thing, call it a, you know, Venus Mars thing. I mm -hmm. need to go through the fire to get to the other side of it. Right. You know, for him, former military is like suppress, repress, move on. Right. And I'm um, like, I don't know how you do that, right? This, I don't want the cells of my body to hold on to this. So no, you need to turn over every rock. That's your, yeah. I, yeah, I definitely did. So I went, um, so I did this hypnosis again, type A, never been hypnotized before, not optimistic it's going to work. Wow. And But I think through everything I'd gone through, I was like, I heard this woman's voice. We did it over video chat. Wow. Um, I recorded them. And so I just released and I just said, you know what? There was something about her when she was talking that she's also a Cuban Jew, which I am. And there, there was a familiarity in her voice, like my grandmother. Oh, and wow. it was just it was the right time, the right space. I, and I just released. And so we spent many hours in therapy until wow. she finally got me to the OR. And when she got me back to the operating room, I saw everything that happened. I'm sure there's this body stuff, but I saw who hit the button for the code. I saw which nurse jumped on my chest to give me CPR. I saw um, that the first crash cart didn't work, but the second one did. I mm -hmm. saw what my husband was wearing when he got off the plane. I saw my sister going to Macy's to buy something and what she was buying. Like, like there were just all of these, these things where I, I heard my doctor saying, this can't be happening. This cannot be happening. Um, you know, and my anesthesiologist was by my feet. So there were all this, right? And then I saw spirits. I saw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of spirits. Um, I saw my grandmother who had passed and I saw my uncle who had passed. And there were things that I write about how, you know, I threaded the needle on, 
you know, how it is that what my cravings were, what was going on during those three months of that, the, the turmoil during the pregnancy. Um, and so I had, and then you, I mean, in the video, you see my body convulse and seize and go through like this gagging thing and then, mm. and then drop. And, um, after I was done with that, I was almost like giving birth again, right? It was mm. like this whole big purge. purge. Yeah. It was a purge, mm. like a colonic. So it was just like, it's <laughs> just everything out, you know? And so by that, uh, when I was done, I told Jonathan, I said, you know, I'm, you know, I, I think I have some answers. And so it's quite graphic. He took a look at it and he's like, I need you to stop this. It was, mm. it was really difficult for him. Mm. So he's, so he said, and then he added the caveat. How do you even know that this is true? This could be a recalled episode of Grey's Anatomy in your head. Right, right, right. Right. And, you know, I get that. I totally get that. I had, you know, it, look, I, my body had been gone through drama. I was not happy with him then. Mm. I was like, he's doubting me again. He doesn't believe me. Mm. Like, I'm not feeling protected. Mm. And I am like, okay, you know, fine. After I was done calling him a lot of names, I called. <laughs> said, I said, how do you know what I'm telling you is the truth? Mm. And she says, well, sometimes the only truth, the only validation we get is the patient feels better and you feel better. And I said, um, I said, yeah, but that's not good enough for me. I have witnesses. So I went back to the doctors who were present and I showed them the tapes mm. and, you know, one was like, you know, well, so it wasn't really like, you know, when you flatline, typically when you go into cardiac arrest, things happen to your body, but it wasn't mm. like that. It was like a gagging thing. And I showed her the video. I said, was, did it look anything like this? And she said, it looks exactly like that. Wow. And then the other anesthesiologist was like, I don't remember having two crash cards you think I'd remember. And then um, she's like, but we were all traumatized through this. Mm -hmm. This was their first AFE patient and mm -hmm. it was, you know, painful. And so, and then when she checked, she was like, yeah, we did. And then my other doctor was my OB. She's like, I said, did you say this can't be happening? This can't be happening. She's like, I did, mm -hmm. but in my head, you know, mm -hmm. and so, and, and wow. she's like, well, I was whispering it under the mask or whatever, but I was like, I was like, so I had definite answers for me as far as um, life after death and the whole near death experience. Like, you know, I was talking to a few people that are, that are putting together papers and saying, you know, they say only 10% of the people remember having near death experiences. I, or, or have had near death experiences mm -hmm. that, that go into cardiac arrest or have it. And I said that remember, so the reality is, is like, you know, if you can access the brain and access those memories, maybe more have. Mm -hmm. So, oh, yes. yeah. And I, I, and I've done a lot of research on um, the fact that, you know, psychology today will say, of course you want your loved ones who have passed to be there. Of course mm -hmm. it's wishful thinking. And I said, okay, let, let's put a pin on the ones that I know. It's the ones that I don't know that had messages for people that I know here. And mm -hmm. so when I bring back information to my loved ones here from mm -hmm. their loved ones that are in this other dimension, they're like, oh, how, how, how would you know that there's no way, you know? Yeah. 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 It's, it's incredible. I mean, what your near-death ex I mean, I learn something new every day. Uh, but to me, your near-death experience blew me away with the evidential details, but also the value that hypnosis had on your path. Because a lot of people just will say, hey, I had something, but I don't remember anything. And I think your story could really speak to a lot of people to really visit it on a deeper level, just because you don't remember it and your conscious mind does not mean that it's there in that subconscious storehouse. Right. So maybe for viewers, could you speak to the significance that hypnosis had to you versus, you know, therapy, which seemed to get you to a certain point, but hit a wall? Like yeah. how did, you know. So the therapy, you know, I would tell anyone considering regression or any kind of hypnosis to do mm -hmm. traditional therapy first, because you are dealing with your traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there was an element of supernatural, if you will, that happened prior to my near death experience that was, I was having a really hard time with it, which was causing more trauma for me thinking about how am I going to live my day to day if I don't get some answers. But I would suggest that anybody considering hypnosis, even though they say it's not going to hurt you, um, it was still painful. It was a process to, I mean, it was, it was physically exhausting. It was emotionally draining. It, um, it was not easy. So it's, it's kind of like if I want to compare it to pregnancy, um, you can't get pregnant the regular way. So then you try artificial insemination. You can't do that. And then you're going to go to IVF. Um, IVF is extreme, right? We've done it seven times, but people will tell me, you know, well, you know, I can't do IVF. I'm like, well, then you don't want a baby badly enough. And so that is part of, and that's okay, right? That's, you know, but this is part of the process. So I would tell you that, yes, traditional therapy, if you're not doing it because it's painful, this might not be the way to go. But um, as far as hypnosis for me, um, because there was nothing traditional about what happened, I didn't think traditional therapy was going to be the right path for me. And, and it was, it was almost like a domino effect. Like I had to, I came out with a story. I questioned doctors. I had my husband saying, repress, you know, suppress everything. I tried to do traditional therapy, got asked by Steve Harvey. Did you see the light? It wasn't even part of like my conversation. It's, um, I wasn't interested in looking at, you know, life after death. I was looking at life after near death, life after flatline. What was my life going to be like afterwards? And I stumbled across, oh, there is life after death, but I got answers to this other dimension while I was living prior to flatlining. And that was invaluable to me. Um, that, that definitely helped me. And because I videotaped it and then had the doctors on camera in shock. Like mm. I did not go to medical school for this, that you should not remember this. I mean, and they were like, and some, and most of the doctors that were on my case have changed the way they practice medicine. They realized that consciousness is existing outside of the body. My one doctor, she was like, cause I told her, I said, you were treating the body, but you weren't treating me. You weren't talking to me. Mm. And she was profoundly sad after that. She said, yeah, and she's a, she's an amazing, compassionate physician. But in that moment, they're worried about saving my life, of course, but they're not, they're not fully aware that I'm they're not fully tuned into your condition, you know, and as much as this was eye opening for you, like you said, it was eye opening for the medical community that that were uh, that your team was. And for myself, this is a focus that I do as a therapist and stories like yourself, you know, and I reference, reference them periodically to my clients or in my trainings, which is how valuable it is for professionals to have an understanding, you know, of these phenomena of near-death experiences. And someone like yourself, once you're able to have these types of answers and closures and you're able to label it and name it, it seemed like your life was able to move forward. But when you're going to a professional and they're looking at you just as perplexed as you're feeling, I mean, that's a very deflating feeling and you just could feel quite demoralized and you wonder why people could become so depressed. And many times, you know, the systems fail to understand, to develop compassion and to just look into something beyond their scope of basic training. Well, yeah. And the other thing is, it's like, you know, in medicine, they're, they're, you know, it, it's like, it's going back to narrative medicine, really actually getting to know the patient, mm -hmm. you know, to, to come full circle on our story that it was that very last phone call with my anesthesiologist that didn't know me mm -hmm. that said afterwards, who I thought no one was listening to me, mm -hmm. she said she was uncomfortable that she had a patient who'd had a baby before had um, had a C-section before, spoke exactly clearly about what was going to happen and sought out specialists to save her life. And with that last ditch effort on my part, she is the one that flagged my file and incorporated extra blood in a crash cart in the operating room. Hmm. Wow. And, uh, you know, and when I think back about it, you know, when I talked to her about it, she was like, you know, I didn't realize like that was my most intuitive moment. She said, when 
your flag came up and I was, you were not getting triage and I was putting file work in the, in the computer. She's like, I had this urgency that I needed to come meet you. And then I had to be in the OR with you. And there's no reason for her to be there because there was an attending um, anesthesiologist there and you only need one when you're doing a C-section. Mm-hmm. When she came in, she told the attending anesthesiologist, she's like, I've got a bad feeling about this. Mm-hmm. And so we were connected, that we were soulfully connected. We will be for the rest of our lives. Mm-hmm. Um, she is an incredible intuitive physician. And I think that most clinicians can learn a lot about listening to the patient a little differently instead of brushing them off. Nurses, same way, you, and, but the, you're working long shifts, you're hearing stories. Right. And, and there are legitimate histrionic neurotic people that will, you know. <laughs> right, 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 right. But like I said to this one faculty advisor at, at a medical school that I was lecturing, he says, Tiffany, I'm familiar with your story, but I'm not going to flag everybody, every histrionic pregnant woman mm and put blood and crash cart in each each operating room. And I said, I'm not asking you to do that. What I'm asking you to do is know your patient. I said, these doctors I've been with before, I've delivered a baby with them before. Mm. I'm not a neurotic histrionic person. This was atypical behavior of me. Mm. And so the one person that flagged my file was one that listened to the whole story of what my fears were and did not say, and she was like, it sounded off alarms in her. And it didn't for my other doctors, but thank God, you know, they, they all end up with an amazing team and emergency drills work and, um, and I'm alive today because of it. It's so important, you know, and I'm employed by the biggest hospital conglomerate in the United States. And during the trainings that we had, you know, they said the client isn't just a number. They come from a family, they come from a community and they're walking into your office and you need to treat that client as if that family member that you know and you love is in your hands. And yeah. we all have been there on the other side of it. And it's not just a number that you're trying to push away to get to the next, but it's a person in a system and you have to treat it like one of your own. And I, I, I know that's something you certainly is emphasized in a lot of your work. And um, my one of my final questions for you is, how did this maybe shift or change your worldview? Because I know you mentioned we're both from the Jewish faith. Mm -hmm. Did you find a degree of congruency, lack of congruency, uh, symmetry, you know, symmetry with your afterlife kind of visions and experience? Like how did you find that they merged well together? There was a time where it's just like, these are two separate entities and I have to reevaluate you know, my faith a little bit? It's, it's a great question. Um, no, I did not reevaluate my faith. I, you know, I spoke to my rabbi prior to writing my book and I said, does this go against Judaism? Not that, I mean, it's my truth. So I'm just letting you know, once I put this out, he's like, no, not at all. He's like, there were seers in the Bible there, you know, and, and what he calls that, you know, there were prophets, there are seers, people have been intuitive throughout history. He's like, you know, when intuitive moments kept happening, he's like, Stephanie, just because you can see it doesn't mean you have to say it. And, and that's where we differed because there was, um, I had someone on Instagram that, that read my book and, and she had just had a miscarriage and she posted that the book helped her. And I said to her, I said, well, thank you for taking me on vacation with you. And all of a sudden I got a download and I was like, oh my God, you're about to be involved with a catastrophic childbirth. Mm. Now I am nobody. And I'm, this is somebody who just read my book and she, I didn't know she had a miscarriage until wow. she told me she like, I just had a miscarriage. I said, no, I said, but the words I used were, were involved. And she said, well, I'm a doula and I've been a doula for 10 years. And I said, mm. um, just be aware that, you know, there might be something. And, and, you know, she's from the Orthodox community. And so you don't go to psychics, you don't talk to intuitives, right? Yeah. So, so um, she's like, well, nothing, you know, catastrophic has ever happened in our practice. And I was like, it's coming. And rightfully so, she no longer speaks to me, right? So I told mm-hmm. my rabbi, I was, he's like, you cannot speak up like this. You know, you need the, you know, whatever. And you could be wrong. And I said, you're absolutely right. I apologize to her. I I wrote an apology blog, not about pointing it out of who it was, but I just said, I said, sometimes you need to shut the F up. Right. 
Mm -hmm. And just because I can see something doesn't mean I'm right. It doesn't mean anything. So several weeks later, we were, um, Jonathan and I and the family were on vacation and I get an emergency private message from her. And she said, uh, sorry, I had my hands full, what have you, but we were, I had another doula in our practice that was delivering her niece's eighth child. And uh, she had an amniotic fluid embolism and she died on the table. Hmm. And he, she said, and because I had texted back and forth I gave her the resources of the foundation, the AFE foundation. Mm-hmm. I told, you know, I said, while well, you're in the throes of everything, she's like, we were able to, to communicate, connect the physicians. And, and so that helped, but it, but it was it jarring for me. So when I went back to the rabbi and he's like, don't listen to me. So I was like, I said, I, there is, um, there is nothing to me that, uh, that separates Yiddishkeit from, from what I feel or what I sense. Um, I think that if it, if, if what I say or what I experience pushes you to go to the doctor and check out something, you should have done it anyway. And if everything's clear, it's clear. And so what you waste a little time, you know, you waste some energy, Mm -hmm. but maybe they catch something that, um, that you weren't going to. And then in which case then that is meant to be as one would say, like you crossed my path, but, um, but I would say that from a spiritual place, especially dealing with the likes of my husband, who has, who is a Cohen, um, but he is, uh, he went from being agnostic to a hopeful agnostic through this process. Um, he, you know, that. I still like to understand the science behind the energy that I feel from people. And so there is a quantum physics, quantum quantum mechanics, all that. Yeah. There is something there just like, because you feel it, It, you know, it's children repel, you know, from things that they don't like dogs move away from people or energy that they don't like. And you walk into a room and you're like, I don't know what's happening here, but I don't, it doesn't feel right. And there is something there. So I just, until I have an answer, which I may never have, um, and I quantum mechanics is too heady for me. So (laughs) when, when we get quantum mechanics for dummies and like, you just really break it down to I can tie things together, then (laughs) that'll help. Um, but until then I will go with, um, I don't really care whether you believe intuition is spiritually based or we're hardwired for it as long as you listen to it. It's a, it's a very, I, I think it's a GPS of our life. And knowing you, it seems like this experience has transformed you where now it seems like you are owning who you are. You're listening to that voice. Uh, you're walking the talk. Um, would you say that's your biggest takeaway or message that you got from this whole you know, traumatic near death experience, you know, life altering transition, or is there like a message that sticks out to you even beyond that? I mean, there's comfort in knowing that life doesn't end when we do. And whether that's somebody's hopeful wish or whether it's true, um, I believe it's true. My experience tells me that it's true that we go from a solid to some, another matter, right? Um, I say, I say, we go from a solid to a gas, and somebody is like, "I don't want to be a gas," and I'm like, "Well, it's a metaphor. It wasn't." You know, so, <laughs> right, but, right, right. but the idea that I can feel things around people or their loved ones is more than quantum mechanics mm-hmm. to me. It's like there's there's a presence, there's a smell, there's somebody that that is related to that person that's still around them that that appears. Um, so that for sure is, is a, um, sense of comfort. I don't have the fear of death, uh, even though I don't want to go anywhere because I missed my husband and my children, but, um, but at least I know that I'll be around and they're aware that there's something else outside of ourselves. It's a very comforting feeling for viewers to listen to. And I know for yourself to have the actualization and realization of, uh, Stephanie Arnold, I loved reading your book, 37 Seconds. I recommend it to all my clients and viewers. 
but um, where's the best place to purchase it? Probably through Amazon, 37 yeah, seconds, and it's a number one bestseller. And for people who want to follow you, you're also on Instagram or faith. Where's the, where could people find you? It doesn't matter. I mean, Instagram is probably the one that I'm, I'm most um, right. active, if anything. Right. Um, so yeah, I'm on Facebook, but on Instagram, it's Steph Arnold. Yeah. You've done so much, you know, public work. I know you were on Netflix surviving death and I just loved your segment, you know, right in the first like episode. And I know my friend, Bob Ginsburg from the forever family foundation was there too, but, um, we know that there's no ending, but my question for you, is there anything, you know, maybe up the pipeline or any wood burning for you in terms of creative projects, or that's more something kind of brewing that you're making yeah. sense of? Um, I'm working on the second book, but you know, with the way the world is right now, I'm trying to gather my thoughts about like, what is the message? And so it's going to appear later because I can't even imagine putting something out right now with the world the way it is. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the, I did sell the book rights. So working on the movie, wow. um, and so I'm writing it. I'm definitely not the writer for this movie because they want it bigger and they want it, you know, enhanced. Like I used to produce some reality shows, but, uh, but I have, I have my truth and it's very difficult for me to fictionalize my truth. So it, need, it needs to have integrity, needs to be real. That's yeah. congruent with who you are. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Stephanie Arnold, uh, you're someone who I have a great deal of admiration for. You're absolutely a heroic figure, and I, I know you've influenced so many lives. And just an honor to be here with you on my channel. You're welcome back anytime, and uh, it's just a pleasure to know you. So thank you so much for your generous time and your incredibly inspiring story. Thank you so much, Jacob. So are you. Thank you. Well, that was a profound conversation with Stephanie. I loved, you know, that she was able to share her own miracle that she experienced in recovery. We were able to touch in on topics such as hypnosis, therapy, and also, of course, her own powerful near-death experience and the beings that she saw and how that really shaped her worldview. So Stephanie was a tremendous guest. I know she will bring a lot of inspiration and hope to many viewers. But for those of you tuning in, thank you for uh, tuning into this powerful conversation. We'll see you here next time on the Wisdom Jacobs Ladder. Keep on being a part of that community by hitting that subscribe button, sharing your thoughts in the comments section, and hitting that bell notification icon to stay up to date. This is Jacob Cooper signing off. We'll see you here next week on the Wisdom Jacobs Ladder. Mm -hmm.